Hey guys, so I thought it was time to make a video about Twitter itself. It's something that I kind of accidentally got decent at. It's something that I didn't set out to be good at, to have a big following on, but that just kind of happened. Originally, I was making YouTube videos and I thought that, you know, YouTube, I need to get the word out because I'm not getting a lot of traffic right away. What's the best way to do that? And people told me, oh, you should go on Twitter. That's a great place to share your content. So that's why I ended up creating a Twitter account. It was not originally my intention to have any kind of serious platform or footprint over there. But that's kind of the way things have gone. That's where most people now find my work. Obviously, you're watching this on YouTube or listening on the podcast or on Blaze TV. And so you know about the long form content, but a lot of people first interact with my Twitter and then they kind of move to one of those other platforms. So Twitter is kind of where a lot of my base started. And so that's interesting because I end up going on these podcasts or I get interviewed by people and they ask me, oh, how should we be using Twitter? How should we un understand Twitter? What's something that people don't get about Twitter? How do you get good at Twitter? And these are all things I've talked about multiple times with different interviewers, but it's all scattered on different guest appearances and that kind of thing. So I thought it would be good to have a discussion on the channel here in one focused video because I don't just want to talk about what Twitter is or how you can get good at it, though I am going to talk about those things. But I also want to talk about changes that are happening. Obviously, we know that Elon Musk is taking the platform in a different direction. He's even technically renamed it, though I refuse to call it X. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe someday I'll catch up with that change. But so far, it's still Twitter to me. And But I do want to talk about the direction he's taking it because there are big changes on the horizon I think he's changing some serious parts of Twitter. They're going to alter the way that you can use it and the way you can be successful at it, or what the platform even is for a lot of people. And so I want to talk about all that in today's video. But first, let's go ahead and start at the beginning. So what is Twitter? What sets it apart from other social media platforms? That's the thing that you need to think about, right? The social media platform, what makes it important is what it's not. The key to a social media platform is what it's not, right? It, it You don't want every social media platform to do the exact same thing or they all just blend together. We've seen a lot of, you know, Twitter clones or Facebook clones or Instagram clones, people just taking the same idea and slapping a different coat of paint on it and calling it a new social media platform or they tried to meld too many aspects of all the different platforms and just swirl them together. And that just gets you nowhere. It's not distinct. It doesn't give people a reason to use the platform. So Twitter has a couple things that make it uh, very different from other social media platforms that allows it to stand out. The first thing really is the user base. Uh, the Twitter user base is smaller than most social media platforms. It's uh, you know very minuscule compared to some of the bigger competitors. However, the key to Twitter is that it captures the right type of people. Twitter is a platform that lends itself due to its limited character uh, aspect. It used to be much shorter, but now it's like 256 or whatever. Uh, and, and I guess now that you can subscribe, you can make it much longer, which is its own discussion about the problems that we'll talk about here in a second where Twitter's, Twitter's going to lose its distinction. But early on, Twitter lent itself to a very particular type of word cell, basically, the kind of person who is good at delivering messages, setting frames, using their lingui high linguistic IQ to kind of bring that to the platform. And so the way that Twitter was shaped, the way that it presented itself, so it's self-selected for a particular group that would be successful, that would enjoy it. And it was mainly the kind of people who were cultural movers and shakers, uh, journalists, uh, media types, those that wrote film or television, it, it attracted the kind of people who uh, shaped a lot of public opinion, a lot of media, a lot of academia, a lot of celebrities kind of flocked to the platform. And so it created a situation where there are a lot of highly influential people who really regularly were interacting with each other. So when you were on Twitter, you could go directly to the celebrity, you could go directly to the thought leader, you could... You could dunk on the professor. You could make jokes with uh, the, the comedian. You know, these are all things that you could directly interact with these people. And that's the other big aspect is in many ways, Twitter has this, the common man can brush up against the celebrity or the influential person uh, aspect to it, right? You can uh, talk to somebody famous. You can 
influence somebody's opinion who might hold a large amount of sway. You can challenge somebody who uh, holds uh, you know, a New York Times uh, column or something like that. You can directly interact with you know, famous people, with opinion shapers. There, there's this, uh, the average person gets to walk in and, and kind of interact with these pe people thing that really sells the platform and sets it apart. Another big thing about Twitter is really the fact that it allows for anonymity. At least it did. Obviously, that might also be something that's going to change, but we'll get to that in a second. But the anonymity aspect of Twitter allows a lot of people who otherwise would have their voices silenced uh, in many countries where they're directly oppressed by their governments or in ones like the United States where there's not technically legal repercussions all the time, though ask Douglas Mackey about that. Anonymous accounts still allow people who would be afraid of getting fired from their job or having their lives destroyed uh, due to political correctness. They can, again, get in there, mix it up, have opinions, have thoughts, and they can express them in a, in a way. Now, a lot of people don't like that aspect of it. Uh, people like Jordan Peterson famously got very angry about the fact that people have anonymous accounts on Twitter. Uh, but I think it's really essential. I think it allows ideas to flow in a way that they wouldn't anywhere else. Uh, you regularly see, again, very large accounts uh, interact with people that they otherwise would never interact with because of this situation. And I think that creates a conversation that just doesn't exist anywhere. It's a dynamic that does, just doesn't exist anywhere else, uh, which is really interesting. You have plenty of platforms that allow you to just be really anonymous, but mo most, you know, you don't have a lot of famous people. You don't have world leaders. You don't have big journalists and movie stars and stuff show up to those places. And you have plenty of places where there's those kind of accounts. Uh, you know, Facebook is full of all these accounts from different media empires, different celebrities, uh, you know, government officials, those kind of things. But they rarely really interact with the people there. And then you still have to kind of use your real name on Facebook. And so uh, they definitely don't get the, the hardest kind of challenges because there's not this interaction between uh, kind of anonymous people who are really able to speak their mind and these really powerful people or people who, in a lot of influence who uh, actually personally run their account. Of course, there are plenty of people who just have corporate, you know, proxy stand-ins. Obviously, like Joe Biden's not running his Twitter account. Obviously, that, that that's very clear. But you get people like Donald Trump, right, who really do run their account. That's that's a real thing. And so, you, and you can see this because so many celebrities, like you know, flip out and burn out and and post crazy and outrageous things and end up uh, getting themselves in trouble. So you know it's real. Like for for whatever reason, whether this is a good or a bad thing. Twitter drives people, even famous people and even influential people to post for themselves instead of allowing kind of some safe corporate uh, handler to do it for them. Again, not everybody. There's obviously people who have proxies uh, you know, running their accounts for them, but there's a much higher percentage of real person interaction on Twitter than you get kind of with other platforms. Universities today aren't just neglecting real education, they're actively undermining it, and we can't let them get away with it. America was made for an educated and engaged citizenry. The Intercollegiate Studies Institute is here to help. ISI offers programs and opportunities for conservative students across the country. ISI understands that conservatives and right-of-center students feel isolated on college campuses and that you're often fighting for your own reputation, dignity, and future. Through ISI, you can learn about what Russell Kirk called the permanent things, the philosophical and political teachings that shaped and made Western civilization great. ISI offers many opportunities to jumpstart your career. They have fellowships at some of the nation's top conservative publications like National Review, The American Conservative, and The College Thinker. If you're a graduate student, ISI offers funding opportunities to sponsor the next great generation of college professors. Through ISI, you can work with conservative thinkers who are making a difference, Thinkers like Chris Rufo, who currently has an ISI researcher helping him with his book. But perhaps most importantly, ISI offers college students a community of people that can help them grow. If you're a college student, ISI can help you start a student organization or a student newspaper or meet other like-minded students at their various conferences and events. ISI is here to educate the next generation of great Americans. To learn more, go to ISI.org. That's ISI.org. So that brings us to the other thing about Twitter, which is Twitter is in many ways a blood sport. Uh, you know, that again, this might not be the best aspect of uh, humanity on display here, but it is just something that's true 
about Twitter. Uh, there's obviously many different corners of Twitter. Not everybody's on there for the politics. Not everybody is on there for the gossip or the drama. However, Twitter is the kind of place where this stuff spreads quickly and in public. And so there's always this uh, this kind of live combat aspect to it. It's like it's like watching a race, right? You're 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 technically watching the race for the Daytona 500 or or you know uh, the Indy cars or whatever. You're really you're supposed to be watching it. Uh, for the fact that you want your favorite guy to win, you want to see the exciting, uh, you know, uh, changes in position and passing and see who can make it in and out of the pit the fastest. But let's be honest, we all know that to some degree, everybody's watching because there might be a car crash, like something might explode, somebody might die, like something horrific might happen. And as much as we don't want to admit to ourselves that that's part of the reason you're watching the race, it is a reason you're watching the race. And this is also true of Twitter. There is this feeling of like everybody's playing with live ammo and at any moment someone could just blow themselves up, right? Some, someone might just destroy their presidential campaign or destroy their career or become an internet celebrity overnight. And this has ruined many people's lives. It's also made many people rich. It's made many people famous. So uh, there, there's, this, there's this very real sense of going viral. Uh, that can happen for the good or the ill and can happen at any time. And even though you might be in one little corner of Twitter, maybe you might be focused on one kind of specific subject uh, that, that you're in in Twitter and only a few people follow you in that area. All of a sudden you could post one thing and it could be amazing. And a big post, a big account could share it and another big account could share it. And all of a sudden there are millions of views on an account that maybe had 300 followers out of nowhere because of this very viral nature. And so, you know, the in many ways, Twitter is successful because of the crowd it attracts and the format it has, its viral nature, and the fact that it really does allow, finally, for kind of this uh, inter-faction combat. Uh, Twitter is not an echo chamber. So like I said, there's plenty of other sites that have attempted to rip off Twitter. You've had, uh, you know, the, these different uh, these different social media proxies uh you had i think mastodon was the the liberal one all the journalists were trying to flock to and then of course you have you have right-wing variants like gab and things and they all have their merits i'm not i'm not trying to bash anybody i use gab as what kind of my secondary uh you know backup uh social media twitter twitter proxy uh these things exist however they tend to be echo chambers right there, there's not a lot of cross-faction contact as we're in Twitter, because again, it's this public square, it is this hub, everyone's there, everyone's interacting. You really do see like the host of a CNN TV show go at it with some, you know, guy with a frog, uh, <laughs> with a frog in his, uh, in his profile. You know, you'll, you'll get people, rappers yelling at, you know, political pundits who are uh, yelling at policemen and government officials. It's, it, it just, you know, the left and the right and the libertarians and the, the communists, they, they could all just jump on each other any moment. And this kind of uh, constant ability of these different factions to clash. And, you know, again, it's the Coliseum. People show up. They want to see blood. Again, it's not the best part of human nature, um, but, but it is there. And if you want to understand the platform, that's something you want to understand about it. So that, that's what Twitter is. So how... Can people use Twitter? What, what's, what are the best ways to, to, to use Twitter? What's the best ways to understand it? Well, there's a couple different ways to think about Twitter. Obviously, the first thing is how you want to use it, right? Your goals could be very different. So I can explain to you from my experience in you know, political punditry uh, what some things that work for me, but that might not be what works for you if you have an entirely different uh, kind of idea of wh who you want to be or what you want to do or how you want to present yourself. A lot of people just want to go on Twitter and basically lurk, right? They just want to read the posts. Uh, they want to see something from their favorite people. They want to check in on what's going on. And that's fine. Twitter is probably the best news site in the world, uh, not because it's everything on it is accurate, but because it's unfiltered in many ways. Uh, we actually know Twitter is highly filtered by the government or it was under previous uh, administrations of Twitter, especially uh, from the Twitter files. However, even with all of that censorship, it is still probably the least filtered kind of version of the news because, again, Twitter goes viral. Things explode immediately. And so Twitter can have news stories hours before any major news 
uh, site has anything on it. They can have, they scoop things all the time. And it's not just being scooped, it's being interacted with repeatedly. It's being iterated on. People are immediately looking for more information. They're doing more research, all these things. And so Twitter is an excellent just news aggregator. Again, you have to become the filter. You have to learn what to trust, who to trust, uh, what information is reliable. You have to, you can't just go on there and say, well, because it's on Twitter, it's real. But if you just want the raw feed of kind of the matrix, right? You just want to see the ones and zeros going by, and then you make the decision of kind of what is real and what isn't, Twitter's your source. That that, that really is where this kind of world news mind dumps itself before anything gets filtered through the AP wire and spit back out as propaganda. So if you're just that person and you just want to see some of your favorite content creators or social media people, or you just want to check in on the news, that's fine. That's a great way to use Twitter. And you know, you don't have to do a lot of posting. That's not a big deal. Uh, just enjoy it. However, if you're going to post and, and you're posting for a particular reason beyond just sharing a few things with a friends, or you know, you've got a small group of internet friends or real life friends, and you just want to post things between each other. So other people can see it. If they, again, if that's what you're doing, by all means, that's great. Not everybody needs, needs to try to grow their account. Not everybody needs to try to become big on Twitter. I'm just saying, you know, this advice will not be for you. This, this will be advice for people who specifically are looking to grow their account and, and try to kind of get a larger voice on Twitter. So a couple things to think about when you're looking at Twitter. I think there are probably three main types of really successful Twitter accounts. Obviously, if you're LeBron James or Donald Trump, you're going to be you're just going to be successful because your name is already huge. So that, that this is not you don't need any advice from me. You're not coming to watch this video if if you're Donald Trump or or someone like that who automatically would have a huge audience anyway. But if you're so if you're an average person who's trying to grow on Twitter, I think there's kind of three uh, main archetypes of how that happens. So the first one is the meme account. Meme accounts are really easy to do, uh, and they're usually uh, easy to get successful with. You can grow a very large meme account very quickly, uh, and it's it's great, especially now that Twitter is monetized, which is, again, something we'll address near the end of the video. But now that Twitter is monetized, uh, meme accounts can be incredibly profitable because they're highly shareable. Again, viral nature of Twitter. That's something to always remember about Twitter the viral nature of it. One of the big mistakes people make, again, is they get on there and they want to read, they want to type the one big thread, right? They want to get on there and make the big effort post that's going to blow everybody's mind and show how smart they are. And once everybody reads it, they'll, they'll finally be recognized as kind of the, the intellectual luminary that they are. But that's not really what Twitter rewards. Twitter is a visual medium in a lot of ways. It's a quick catch thing. People are scrolling through their feed really quick or they're, they're, looking at their phone in between sets at the gym or, you know, on the toilet or whatever, let's be honest, you know, you know, you're doing it. And uh, th they're not spending a lot of time on each post. So if you just hit people with walls of text all the time, they're not going to pay attention if they don't know who you are. So these effort posts, these high intellectual inter uh, internet posts, you can do those. However, you usually need a, an audience of some size before those become successful. So meme accounts are great because they are fantastic for going viral. They're very accessible for most people. Uh, they tend to have a, a, a good outreach. Uh, they're easy to monetize if that's something you're worried about. If you, as long as you're not doing super spicy memes, uh, you, know, you usually are very easy to stay monetized. And so you're going to see a higher return if you're, uh, you're a subscriber on, on Twitter Blue. And so this, these are all advantages of the meme account. Again, you can see these things uh, you know, start and they can skyrocket, become very popular very quickly. So if you just want to do a very basic account, you don't want personal no notoriety. You just want to, because usually these are anonymous, right? You Usually it's kind of a libs of TikTok thing uh, where eventually you might become a big deal once your account's huge. But for the most part, it's under a pseudonym. It's usually anonymous. Uh, and so uh, you kind of can set this up, not have to put your face out there, not have to put your personality out there, get a large imprint, maybe make some money off of it. This is a good way to get things started. Also, if you're just, the, if, even if this isn't your plan, if your plan isn't to become a meme account, posting memes is still a great idea. This is where I really got started, to be honest. I was making memes. And it's great if you can make the memes because then they're original to you. 
And so if you're posting memes that are original to you and people can recognize that they're not just something that you ripped off a Facebook page somewhere or found on the internet and they've seen it a million times, then they'll start to recognize your account and you'll stand out. But uh, even if you're not a meme account, memes are still a fantastic way, especially if you're the one making the memes, to really grow a brand and, and get noticed. So even if you're not a meme account, uh, mix them in. But just in general, memes are a great way. It's like one of the three pillars of Twitter if you want to have access, a successful account. The second way to really structure your account and the second archetype you can have is to focus on a specific topic, a specific subject. So the subject matter expert is somebody who's repeatedly posting on the same thing. So whether it's working out, uh, gardening, politics, video games, whatever it is that you're focused on, if you can keep yourself kind of mostly in that lane, it doesn't have to be every single thing you post, but 75% at least probably needs to be on that topic, maybe even higher, so that you're consistently providing something that people want to tune into you for. So you probably won't be anyone's favorite account this way as like a general use, but you will be a lot of people's go-to source on kind of a particular thing. And this is very useful because a lot of people usually have multiple interests. So maybe you've got somebody who's interested in politics, but they also play video games. They also like sci-fi literature. Uh, they like funny cat videos. Like they're, you know, they're, they're going through all these different topics. And so, you know, they, they kind of assemble all these different accounts that they're following, each of which are experts in a specific area. So if you can consistently post on something, if you're a subject matter expert or you're passionate about something, you're willing to do research or make content on it, you're willing to do deep dives or make videos, uh, these are all things that you can do and kind of create that subject matter expert class. Now, there's also some uh, some crossover here with the meme account. You've probably noticed there are meme accounts that only post about a specific thing. Uh, so, uh, you know, these are memes that are all about sports or these are memes that are all about cats or these are memes that are all about politics or, you know, whatever. And so, uh, you know, th these aren't mutually exclusive, but I'm just saying if you want to move beyond just the I don't have a face, I don't have a personality, all I do is post memes and they're funny to something where I express opinions and I actually kind of have a, a more uh, meaningful content that allows people to understand what I'm thinking and more, more of a personality, then this is where your subject area expert really helps. Again, focus is really important. If your subject matter uh, account and you start posting off subject, you'll see a huge dip in your responses when you post off subject. Again, that doesn't mean you can't ever do it. it doesn't mean you can't ever try to branch out. Don't be a slave 100% just to that one thing. But just remember, that's why most people are following you. So if you branch out, you want something that's adjacent or something like that. You don't want to just start, you know, building your entire account around, you know, your knowledge of basketball or something, and then immediately start posting about anime or politics or something. You, you want to stay focused in a specific lane uh, in general that will kind of bring people back to you over and over and over again. So you're well known. Uh, this is another time to remind people that uh, Twitter is great for repetition. A lot of people post things once online and they think that that means that everyone has seen it. But that's not really the case. Uh, Twitter shows your followers actually a very low number of your actual posts, especially if they follow a wide variety of people. So if you only follow like 200 people, you'll probably see a lot of their posts. But if you're following a thousand or more people, which a lot of people do, you're really going to see very few of the posts that people make. So remember that as when you are as a poster putting something out there, a lot of people ask me, hey, why do you keep repeating this thing or that thing? And the one answer is, well, it's really important. But two, it's because Twitter is a place that actually rewards that repetition. If you are known for something, if you're known for subject matter expertise and you're repeating essential things that people need to understand, that can start to become a slogan. That can start to be uh, something that you're known for. And that's good. That kind of creates that feedback where people identify an opinion or a position with you and they come back to you over and over again. When they see it, they call it out, they tag you in it. That's a positive development. That means you're building an audience. The third type of account is just the personality account. Now, these are mostly celebrities. Celebrities come with a built in uh, fan base that are just going to listen to them no matter what. It doesn't matter what LeBron James actually knows about politics or education or something. He can still start a school. He can still 
prattle on about a, uh, an election and people are going to pay attention to him because he's just one of the best basketball players of all time. And it doesn't matter how much he actually knows about things. But if you want to become a personality account, you really probably need to start in a particular area first. You usually, if you're not a celebrity, if you're not somebody that just came with a massive audience, you'll need to be known for something else originally, uh, usually a subject matter expertise, or you had some kind of show you're producing or something like that. And then people just become interested in you in general. But again, this is the, the account that allows you to have the most wide variety of things that you're going to post on. You can post about, you know, what you're doing, what you're, what you're making, uh, you know, in, in the kitchen and then, you know, a vacation post and then your thoughts on a presidential election and then what you've been reading and what you think about a TV show and all these things. And that's great. I guess you can really use it like I guess most people use social, real social media. But it only really works if you already are a personality that people are very compelled and interested in. Uh, you'll see a number of people have done this. Uh, you know, they start as a political pundit or they start as a video game streamer, streamer, that kind of thing. And they build enough celebrity to where basically they don't have to only talk about that stuff anymore. And they can generally expand. So it, it, it is its own thing. I think it's its own distinct account, but it usually gets spun off of again a subject matter expert or somebody who is already creating an audience that then is compelled to listen to them about a much wider variety of things if you want an example of this think of somebody like maybe pewdiepie or a lot of the uh the call of duty streamers i don't know if uh, a long time ago i don't know if you guys remember this this time on youtube there are guys like uh uh like drifter and woody's gamer tag and they started uh, just doing videos about how to get better about uh, playing Call of Duty. And then eventually they got such big audiences that people started watching them play Call of Duty while they were talking about their lives or their girlfriends or race cars or political philosophy or, you know, fiction or movies. And eventually their their audiences didn't really care much about the Call of Duty anymore. And what they really cared about was these people's opinions on a vast uh, variety of subjects. PewDiePie again like that where a lot of people started watching him for the video games but then they were just watching him for the many different things that he did he started doing meme reviews and and make, then he was talking about Aristotle like he just went all over the place and he still had an audience that was willing to follow him the same thing could be true on true on Twitter but you usually have to start somewhere else you have to you have to pull people in on a different thing and then eventually you can kind of have one of these personality accounts if you're successful enough all right so those are the ways you can use Twitter. Those are ways to think about Twitter. A, a couple a couple of other things uh, that aren't necessarily related directly to uh, how to grow an account, but just ways to think about Twitter. When people are posting on Twitter, there, there are very emotional people. There are a lot of people who are just posting because of their emotions. But also remember, there are a lot of people who are posting for a very specific agenda and purpose. They have a disciplined understanding of what the platform does and how to use it. And you can really see this interaction when a professional influence person kind of gets into it with an emotive person because that person will step in and, you know, they're, they're just arguing like a boomer argues politics on Facebook, right? I can't believe you said that. I can't believe blah, 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 blah. When people are doing that and then you see the account just kind of use them and humiliate them in front of their audience, that account is doing something very different, right? The bigger account is using, the, the person who's more disciplined is using the emotion of the posters to entertain their own audience and reinforce their own ideas and spread their own ideas. So there are very disciplined ways to use Twitter and to understand those social interactions and turn them to advantage but they require a different and more methodical way of posting as opposed to somebody who is just out there kind of feeling things and throwing things out there. A couple other things to take advantage of if you're just trying to understand uh, ways to grow Twitter. Twitter does not always, again, necessarily reward in-depth content. That doesn't mean don't make in-depth content. I'm not saying don't be smart on Twitter. You should absolutely be smart on Twitter. What I'm saying is understand that that is usually rewarded after you have eyes on you for other things. So again, uh, quick reactions to, to headlines, posting memes. The key is regular content. Twitter rewards regular content. If you're active and in the algorithm, you'll notice a lot of people who say very 
unintelligent or vapid things have a very large amount of interaction and wide audience. That's because they're appealing to the fact that the algorithm prefers that kind of interaction. Now, one of the things I like to do is, is post uh, wide and then post specific. So I'll, I'll do something that I know is going to get a good wide reaction. It's going to draw a lot of people in a good meme or a good headline reaction for something that is very popular at the moment. That is going to get me a lot of reactions in the algorithm. And then I will follow up with something that is more specific, intelligent, thorough, uh, you know, that kind of thing brings in the detail. So you start with the wide funnel that brings in the audience, and then you get down to specific stuff that allows you to kind of open up and, and give a more complicated and intelligent response. Just remember that, you know, you, you got you to gotta have a billboard before you can get people to the restaurant. You know what I mean? You got to have got to have simple advertisements before people come down and sit down and watch your, your exciting movie. You, you just have to do these things that'll bring in the people before you usually get the wider audience. Once you have it, once you've got that kind of larger audience, then you can post those big, you know, think pieces and people will notice them. But if you effort post and you put out these massive threads and you release your life's work, and it's very intelligent and you have no one watching your account because uh, there, there's just nothing that's engaged with the algorithm previously, then you'll just have dropped it into nothing. It'll be dropped into a void. So that, that's something to keep awareness of. Think, pay attention to what's rolling on Twitter, what's, what's in the algorithm. It, you know, these things pop up. And that doesn't mean you have to chase every one of these. If you don't have something smart to say, if you don't have something interesting to say, just don't say it. Don't just you know say things for the sake of saying them. However, if you do see something that is uh, you know th that is a big event, a big, if a big event is happening and a lot of people are talking about it simultaneously, and you have something intelligent to say on that, then focus on it and don't be scared to say multiple things about it. Don't be scared to post about it multiple times because it's going to pop in the algorithm multiple times. That kind of thing. All right, so. Those are just some tips on how to use them. Again, those are only useful if you're wanting to grow an account, if you want to have somebody be somebody who has uh, some influence or, or a audience on on Twitter. Uh, you know, just never never get too big for your britches. At the end of the day, it's 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 Twitter. But just you know that if you want to grow that stuff, that's for you. If you don't want to be that person, if you just want to enjoy the news or the memes or whatever, then then ignore all that. That that's not a big deal for you. Last thing I want to talk about is where the platform is going. So Elon is making a lot of changes. Uh, some of these changes are for the better. Some of these changes are for the worse. Some of these changes, I'm not sure where they're going, but let's talk about a few of them. So obviously the first thing that happened is a lot of banned accounts got returned and some things that you used to not be able to talk about, like a pandemic that I still can't really get into on YouTube, or you're allowed to talk more candidly about trans issues, those kind of things that stuff has changed. And so those things are good on Twitter. It's better that we don't have those level of restrictions. It's still not a free speech platform to be clear. It's still not just, you can post anything uh, that they can and do and regularly uh, will ban people over all kinds of stuff. So I'm not saying that uh, Twitter is perfect at all. It's not, uh, but obviously it, it's somewhat better on, especially on a couple of specific issues than it used to be. And it's nice to have accounts like the Babylon Bee and stuff back. So uh, th those are positive changes, even though, again, it's still very possible to get banned. You could still get brigaded with through reports, those kind of things. So I'm not saying that they, they fix those problems, really, that they still exist. So th that's one change that Elon has made. A big one that is coming now is monetization and sponsors. So a really interesting thing that's happened is Elon wants to pay people to post. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you've seen a lot of big accounts post these huge things in their bank account. Yeah, all of a sudden they, they get tens of thousands of dollars show up in their bank account, which is fantastic. Good for them. I mean, I, you know, some money is better than none. So that that's great. A lot of people were doing this for free, essentially, and now they're getting paid. So that's very nice. Uh, but this is also try, tied in with kind of the blue check thing, right? So a big change that happened on the platform was Elon opening up the subscription service and the blue checks. So originally blue checks were only given to people who had some kind of social status. They had some kind of government position. They were a celebrity. It was a system where it was very opaque. You didn't really understand what was going on. No one was sure how and why sometimes you would get a blue check. You could apply for it, but a lot of people who should have got one under 
uh, kind of the rules of Twitter didn't get one and people who were obviously famous and needed the blue check to differentiate themselves and keep them from from having spoof accounts made of them, which was the original purpose of the blue check in theory. Uh, they got their blue checks taken away from them or denied to them just because uh, Twitter hated them. And it was kind of a political black mark to take away your, your uh, blue check and that kind of thing. That was the original purpose of the blue check. But when Elon took control, he made blue checks uh, basically purchasable. You just pay for the subscription and along with kind of getting higher engagement and, and all these things, you would also get the ability to have this blue check uh, to kind of differentiate yourself. Now that had kind of two effects. One, it blew up the blue check mafia. Blue check used to mean you were basically regime approved. You know, you were a journalist or you were a celebrity or you were somebody who, who was in good standing with the regime. And so that's why you received your blue check. Now, if you had a blue check, it just meant you paid for it, which meant all of a sudden having a blue check next to your name didn't really mean any kind of status. It didn't didn't uh, confer any kind of privilege, which was a big deal. It was nice that that kind of toppled the the blue check mafia and their their monopoly, because a lot of times on Twitter, you could you know talk to people. You could even make fun of people, insult people all day long. But if a blue check got involved, if someone was in there and they they said something to a blue check that they didn't like all of a sudden that person would get banned. Now you, the blue check could say whatever they wanted and they weren't going to get in trouble because they were regime approved. But if you were harassing a blue check, then you could get in trouble. So that whole system got blown up by Elon and his creation of kind of the subscription service. Now the subscription service is obviously a big deal for Twitter because it brings in a lot of revenue that didn't exist before. The site was pretty much 100% free to use prior to this. And so the invention of the blue check uh, that could just be purchased uh, brought in a large amount of money to the website. Uh, on top of that, now we also have this uh, monetization model. At first, you could just tip people. Uh, now you can subscribe to people and then kind of give them a little bit of extra money every month for some bonus content. And then on top of that, you also have the ability to uh, make money from advertisers. Now, the, the last, last one is the most interesting one. Because again, those big numbers start rolling into people's bank accounts and people get excited and they want to get monetized and all these things. Well, there's a couple different problem, problems with that. Obviously, if you are an anon, if you're somebody who's, who's using a pseudonym on the internet and you want to get some of that cash, well, you're basically going to have to dox yourself to Twitter. You're going to have to give them a lot of personal information. In fact, you already probably have to do that if you have subscribed to Twitter in the first place. And so these these blue check sales and these uh, you know these payouts they encourage people to basically make themselves known at least to Twitter if to nobody else, which is a lot of extra information that Twitter gets to gain. That's a lot of control that they get to have. Another thing that gets to happen with the monetization thing is now Elon's been explaining that well we're really marking people safe for advertisement, which means if someone is running advertisements. And they don't want their their stuff to pop up next to controversial political opinions or something. They can just click the kind of the safe uh, thing when they do their advertisement, and it only appear on uh, on accounts that have been vetted as safe. Which means if you have any opinions that aren't created and you know completely owned by the New York Times and Harvard and uh, NPR or something, then you probably won't be safe. Uh, and the further away you get from uh, those kind of regime approved sources of legitimacy the more likely you are to be not ad friendly. So people who are hoping to make a living off of Twitter or hoping to make a decent side income by kind of posting this stuff basically need to post very safely. Uh, they need to be pretty innocuous, which means you kind of have this YouTube effect, right? That where YouTube disincentivizes people from having any kind of edgy opinions or different opinions, not discussing controversial topics. Everything just maybe needs, needs to be really safe I mean, do you really want to talk about these controversial political things when you could just make money talking about video games? And so it disincentivizes certain types of content, pushes other types of content. It also incentivizes accounts that care about this thing to kind of post empty and meaningless things. Obviously, we've already talked about how memes and stuff are a good way to drive your engagement no matter what. But there is, again, a line, right, whether you want to use that constantly as just the only way of communication or if you just want to use that to boost things so that you can then talk about more important stuff or different stuff. Uh, but really, this this just encourages people to either create controversy or create safety, right? Either you just want to jack up your numbers by getting 
tons and tons of views on all your posts by being uh, really controversial or posting, I should say controversial in the safe way, right? Not not controversial because of you have controversial political opinions, controversial because you're starting drama with somebody or you're, you know, you're getting a lot of eyeballs on you because uh, you got some big account to, you know, to fire back and uh, get into some kind of drama with you about it. That kind of stuff gets boosted. Uh, obviously, just kind of mindless content gets boosted, stuff that will get shared regularly. Those things will get you a lot of money. And so that definitely shapes the way that the platform is going. Obviously, uh, another big change that has been name- made is the name. It's not technically Twitter, even though I'm calling it Twitter. Technically, it's X. I'm just going to keep calling it Twitter because it, it feels weird to call it X. But another big thing Elon is doing, he's, he wants to make this the everything platform, right? That's a big idea of his. This is the everything platform. So he wants this to be a video streaming service. That's part of the monetization thing. He wants this to be the place where you post all of your long form content. You know, that's why Substack became a problem. And so he really wants to focus on keeping people on the website. He wants to turn uh, Twitter into this uh, hub of social media where no one leaves to go look anywhere else. Well, that's kind of a problem because like for me, the original reason I came on Twitter is that's where you shared your stuff so people would go watch other stuff, right? So I didn't get on to Twitter to become good at Twitter, become, you know, big on Twitter. I went on to Twitter to share my YouTube stuff and then eventually my Substack stuff and now the podcast and everything. But I use that to drive engagement to other outlets, to other platforms. Now, obviously, the idea is, well, if you can monetize Twitter, then you don't need to drive people to other platforms. You can, everything can just stay here. But of course, if we already have this ad safe scenario, if we already have this scenario where they're already picking winners and losers and restricting income and the bandwidth and, and visibility of people just because uh, they're not marked uh, advertiser safe, that's only going to get worse. That's only going to become more of a problem as time goes on and as you get focused on this platform to the exclusion of others. So on the podcast, you can say what you want to say because, well, you've got advertisers, you're doing these certain read, live reads and things or whatever. You have uh, people donating. You have alternative ways that aren't just the Twitter approved way to generate income. But if everything has to be Twitter safe all the time, if everything has to make sure that it can fit into the Twitter paradigm when it comes to monetization, that means you're going to start censoring yourself on those other platforms as well. So Twitter is already making it hard to link things like Substack and other stuff onto their platform. I understand a lot of people say, oh, well, these are just competitors. So of course they would do that. That's not their purpose. Well, that's fine. But that's why a lot of people got on here in the first place. Again, one of the reasons that Twitter had the very specific user base that it did, it had the creatives, had the opinion shapers, it had all these uh, kind of people was because they could share their content. It was a good place to ha- share the content and have it go viral. But if Twitter is a place where it's very hard to share your content, then you have less and less reason to kind of come back. Now, obviously, there's still plenty of people on Twitter. I'm on Twitter, so I'm not saying this is tank them or anything. It hasn't done so yet. But I'm just saying long term, the nature of the platform could change as Elon tries to make this one holistic experience where no one ever leaves the platform as opposed to something that is used by content creators, celebrities, opinion shapers, other people to drive those audiences to their other platforms. So it really does lend this idea that that Elon is hoping to shape and control a lot of this stuff. Now, interestingly, a day or two ago, Elon posted something to the effect of Twitter as the human hive mind or Twitter as the human collective unconsciousness Uh, that's something that sounds like a joke, but I don't know if it's a joke. I feel like that is something that Elon is trying to do, turn Twitter into this kind of processing filter for all of human entertainment and knowledge and content and all these things, maybe too ambitious, maybe something that won't happen at the end, but it does feel like a goal that he has. And so that's definitely a thing to keep an eye on as to where the platform is going. It was something that started as a content sharing place, a place to go viral, a place to kind of spar and all these things. But if people are focused on ad friendliness, ad safety, if they're here because they need monetization, because you can no longer drive traffic to other platforms, that could very much alter the way that people interact. And finally, Elon has already been clear multiple times he does not like internet anonymity. 
He does not think it's a good thing. He is against it. And so his efforts to collect a lot of information through subscriptions and monetization on anons really makes you think that that's probably something else he's eventually going to try to get rid of one way or another, which is not something that is great, but it does seem a direction he'll probably go once he's kind of got enough power to do that. All that said, guys, that's kind of what I wanted to cover on Twitter, just give you an idea of how to think about Twitter, what it is, some ways you might be successful on it if you want to, and then where I thought Twitter was going. If you enjoyed the video, of course, please make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like to get these broadcasts as podcasts, make sure that you check out the Oren McIntyre Show on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for coming by, guys. And as always, I'll talk to you next time.